a lot of people, uh, when I started talking to administration here, and I, and I brought up the idea literally last May, knowing I was going to be teaching this course in September, I said, I've got this, this group of uh, students that are studying social entrepreneurship, and I, you know, everything I've ever learned um, about what I, where I get the most out of my, my education has been through hands-on projects outside the classroom. So I was very interested in engaging with the EWB chapter here. And I was inspired because last year I was, I was given the, uh, the Medal of Excellence by Rutgers and I was at the event that was in February and I saw the EWB documentary and I think Elizabeth, I don't know if you were at the event, but you know, uh, it, it got great recognition. Um, and I, I was very inspired and I talked to some of the students at the time and I, I've always had in the back of my mind that I wanted to do this. But when I started mentioning to administration that I wanted to, you know, have my MSE students work with the EWB students, they said, what is social entrepreneurship? So one of the things that I think um, what, what we all know has happened, right? In the United States alone, the United States government spends about $2 trillion a year in an attempt to eradicate poverty, okay? $2 trillion a year. And if you look at it on a per capita basis, right, across roughly 29, 30 federal programs, we basically give out the equivalent of about $24,000 per person. So if you do the aggregate, right, the numbers add up to like an 80-something thousand dollar per family government grant, if you will. Um, now, the average household in America makes about $23,000 a year. So you start to question, how could that be possible, okay? And, and the bottom line is there have been many, many, many attempts over hundreds of years to try to deal with social issues through governmental organizations and through charity. And for the most part, those efforts have not been successful. So what we've begun to see over the last 10 years is this tremendous change in mindset where instead of giving someone a fish, we're going to teach them, first of all, where to fish, you know, how to make the fishing rod, how to catch the fish, how to market the fish, okay, and then how to reinvest in the fishing business, okay? And so there's an opportunity to do something where you can use both your engineering and your business skills. And I realize I say business skills loosely because I know many of you are studying engineering and you have probably fairly limited professional experience. But combine them with your desire to do good. Okay? And as I go through my slides, you'll see the new models, right? The new business models that have emerged over the last few years. And I'm going to talk about a lot of companies. So the gentleman that founded Engineers Without Borders, Professor Amadi, is that how you pronounce his last? Amade. Amade. Professor Amade. So Professor Amade, I know, came here to talk, and I had the benefit of seeing his talk. Um, and I think he speaks more at a very high level about the why, okay? He's, he speaks in a very inspirational way about how important it is to, in his words, not to eliminate poverty, but to enhance wealth. I'm going to speak more about the how and the what. I'm going to be maybe a little bit more on the ground and spend more time talking about very specific examples of both American entrepreneurs and international entrepreneurs and things that they are doing using engineering or science or technology related um, inputs to, to bring real profound impact to different societies and different people. Okay? So, you know, we're sitting here today in a world where and many of my students, I put this slide up, we had an entire class on um, the challenges of what it's like to live in cities like Mexico City with 20-something million people or Shanghai <coughs> or, ben, or, or um, you know, Lagos, Nigeria. And the emotion that, that erupted in my classroom um, was profound, right? Because this is an issue that is so uh, destructive of people's dignity because it consumes so much of their time. Right? And it's a horrendous issue. So we have all of these issues around at, at the very bottom of the pyramid. Right? When I talk about the bottom of the pyramid, does anybody have, a, is that a phrase that means anything to everybody? anybody? So the bottom of the pyramid is the sense that you've got in, in, in the globe, about 5 billion people live on the equivalent of about $2 a day. Okay? And so the problem is, is that for, for hundreds of years, um, there's always been this assumption 
that people that live on $2 a day are not worthy of investment. Um, they're not worthy of the time of industrial organizations or others. And as a result of that, they, they have to live through all kinds of horrendous diseases that kill their young, right? They've got to deal with this. They, they go without food. So what we're seeing today in terms of um, the way social organizations are beginning to impact you know, these kinds of problems, um, and just in one specific example, right, global annual deaths, um, you know, which is something that we've not been able to eradicate despite a tremendous amount of investment. Um, I'm not even going to go through the agenda. We're going to talk through it. Is I want to talk about why some of these problems that have been so intractable for so long are no longer able to be addressed by the, the traditional business models, right? So I'm putting up a slide that I suspect, anybody ever see the business model canvas before? Business model canvas is something that is very, very popular in Silicon Valley and, and essentially any innovation ecosystem where people are building technology-based companies. And it's replacing business plans because the, the belief is business plans are obsolete before you hit the save button. So you no longer go to a, an investor with a 40-page business plan that you've sweated over for three months. There's no time for that. Things are moving too quickly. So when you sit down and try to raise money today, you talk about your business model. And in the world of social impact, the, first, the business model that's been popular for a long time in addressing these bottom of the pyramid types of market opportunities, right, tier five, where you've got five billion people, has been what is called a leveraged nonprofit. Okay, and these are typically organizations that get their money through government grants or foundations. Okay, so this is basically, in, in a word, it's charity. Okay, and now there are some organizations, and I'm going to talk about One World Health in a little while, that are being very effective by taking money from the Clinton Global Initiative. Okay, so I'm not here to say that this model doesn't work, but it's less popular than it used to be. And I'll talk about One World Health and Barefoot College in Bangladesh and India, which is an incredible um, grassroots college that is training extremely impoverished people to be solar engineers, for example. Okay? Incredibly inspirational. The second model, and I'm going to talk about some examples of this. And by the way, one of the, one of the implications of the fact that these uh, foundation or charitable organizations are less um, effective is that at my own school, HALT, the HALT Global Case Challenge is something we've been running for about five years. And Mr. HALT, Swedish gentleman, every year would donate a million dollars to the Clinton Global Initiative to focus on a specific problem. So two years ago, the, the problem was, the focus was on the availability of clean water. And we gave a million dollars to an organization called Water.org that is most famously represented by its front person, Matt Damon. Okay, last year, it was about the eradication of global poverty. What we've learned is that when we give a million dollars to the non-governmental organization, things do not happen nearly as quickly or as productively as we would like. So we are switching to a new model where we will actually give the million dollars directly to the startup team, right, to the new venture founders. And these are all students. These are students from all over the world. So we run competitions on all six campuses. And each of those competitions is almost like an NCAA, you know, March Madness bracket. And the winners of all of those brackets then come to New York and Clinton and Muhammad Yunus, the Nobel Prize winning economist and professor who created the microfinance industry are judges. And this year what will happen is a team of students will actually be given the ability to be incubated within our accelerator and we will give them a million dollars and they will get to actually work on making their idea come to life. So for anybody in the classroom that, you know, I'm gonna talk about some other competitions a little bit later that may be more engineering oriented, right? Just to give you some other things that you might think about. Not that engineering students don't already have enough to do, I, I, I understand that. But just to talk about other things that are going on on the planet that, you know, that I think are very interesting, at least to know about, if not to participate in. But this is a pretty interesting indication that, you know, after donating a million dollars three, four years in a row, we're not seeing the kind of impact, we're not seeing the kind of progress that we had hoped. 
And so now we're going to ask the entrepreneurial energy to be unleashed. And I'm going to get to that in a second. So there's a second model, which is a hybrid nonprofit. And I'm going to talk about some incredible companies. Uh, and I'm going to show you some pictures and some examples and describe what they do. But what, what these people do is they use what they call differential pricing. And so Aura Lab provides intraocular lenses to people that have had cataracts. And you know, in the, in the bottom of the pyramid, people could not afford these intraocular lenses because it would cost them hundreds of dollars to purchase. So Aura Lab has been able to manufacture these for about $2 a piece. They have completely crushed the cost of these things, right, through a remarkable cost reduction process in the way that they manufacture. What they do is they will sell them at market to patients that can afford them, but they will also use their surplus to give them to people that cannot afford them. So they're funding their mission by generating profits, but they're allocating a lot of money to those that cannot afford them. The same thing with Aravind in India. Okay, Aravind in India happens to be now the world's um, believe it or not, highest quality, lowest cost provider of cardiovascular health services. And they also will find people that are unable to have uh, an open heart surgery and they will operate for free. But they will, they will do that only when the patient does not have the means to pay, but they will pay market rates when the patient can pay. And they're delivering incredibly high quality at a very, very low price point. And it's actually being introduced outside of um, you know, places like India as an example. Now, the most current model is what we will call a social business. And a social business is where there is no shame in making a profit. That the belief is, is that in order to carry out your mission and in order to be able to have a sustainable ongoing business long term, that you need to create a profit. And the, the founder of this message is actually the Nobel Prize winner himself, Muhammad Yunus. And he is an extremely, um, he's very emphatic about, you know, there should be no such thing as charity, that he'd rather see people, you know, have the dignity of working. And so giving everybody the opportunity to actually be able to pay for what they get and employing people. And we're going to see some amazing examples of that. Okay? So, and I'm going to go through a lot of different U.S. ventures here as well as some international ones, to give you an example of what some of these social businesses are, again, with a real eye on technology. 